surface. It is what lies under this paradise that makes it of greater interest. They'd long suspected that underneath the soil lay an ancient kingdom awaiting discovery. In 1936, in Liang, Town, Yuhang, Zhejiang Province, a research worker from Shihu Museum, Zhejiang Province, by the name of Xue Xingang, made a sensational Neolithic Age discovery. He published his finds in an article entitled Liang Zhu, the name of the place where the discovery was made. Because a large amount of dark pottery objects were found at Liang Zhu, at first people felt it had to be a branch of Longshan culture, an incorrect notion that lasted until 1959 when the error was finally corrected. The culture discovered at Liang Zhu flourished between 5,300 and 4,100 years ago and it covered a vast area that included today's Taihu Lake, Ningxiao Plain, the Zhou Shan Islands, and the western and northern parts of present-day Jiangsu province. The appearance of silk sped up the pace of world civilization, but we now know that the people of Liang Zhu culture were among the first to enjoy this luxury product as carbon-14 tests have revealed that these pieces of hemp and silk are more than 5,000 years old. Liang Zhu people had already mastered silkworm breeding, silk reeling and silk weaving techniques in ancient antiquity, and the silk they made is surprisingly similar in appearance to modern products. But the image of the silkworm appears in artworks by the people of Hermudu culture, and this means that silk production dates back to 7,000 years ago. But back to the ancient ceremony. We now know that the deceased was the king of the Liang Zhu kingdom. While the body of the king has long decayed, leaving behind not even a trace, the jade burial objects have remained immortal. On a suffocatingly hot summer's day at a site overgrown with weeds in a place named Fanshan, archaeologists from Zhejiang province were carefully removing soil. It was the site of an ancient tomb. After affixing two bamboo poles to reinforce the entrance to the tomb, the scientists entered, and standing on wooden boards, they began very slowly and carefully to brush off the soil covering the objects inside. As the archaeologists worked, one after another, magnificent objects of jade were brought to light. And after these objects were rinsed clean in distilled water, they made their original appearance known. By this time, the archaeologists knew that Liang Zhu people had lived in an era of jade. A brilliant jade culture was being revealed after being in oblivion for 5,000 years. The jade tung was a hallmark of Liang Zhu culture. It was a long square object with a hole running all the way through the middle. Every jade tung ever found bears either a very complicated or a very simple decorative pattern. But no matter the type of decorative pattern, all are similar and were probably crafted into this unique form out of some belief that was deep rooted among Liang Zhu people. But what did these mysterious patterns mean? Although somewhat simpler in design than the jade tung, the jade bee was also a religious object. The beauty of the bee lies in its original colour, free from any adjustment by the person who crafted it. The jade yu was an axe-like weapon often used on the battlefield in ancient China. 
this jade year stood for power, rather in the same manner as a scepter did in the hands of a European king. This jade year features the carving of a bird on its lower part, while its upper part bears an exquisite image of a human figure with an animal face. To Liang Zhou people, this was the supreme god, and this god was worshipped only by the king, never commoners. Jade appears to have played a key role in the lives of the Liangzhu people. Evidently, the kings had many jade craftsmen working for them. Yet, despite almost constant efforts, none of the tools used by Liangzhu jade craftsmen have ever been found. It is clear that Liangzhu rulers had a large number of jade craftsmen working for them. Yet so far, despite repeated efforts, none of the tools used by Liangzhu jade craftsmen have been found. Most Liangzhu jade pieces were made with a kind of stone called soft jade. But this is something of a misnomer. Soft jade is, in fact, harder than iron or steel. Yet without metal tools, Liangzhu craftsmen somehow managed to carve out exquisite decorative patterns on this incredibly hard jade. How they did so remains a mystery. Many of the Liang Zhu jade pieces unearthed are masterworks of miniature carving with lines so fine that they are difficult to discern with the naked eye. In some cases, there are several fine lines in the width of just one millimeter. Just how ancient craftsmen achieved this feat is a puzzle. Besides State Road number 104, which cuts through southeastern China, there is a huge earthen platform. People had long been confused by the appearance of this mountain, as its top had obviously been cut off through human effort. Archaeologists believed it to be the site of an ancient altar, as found scattered around the strange mountain were many Liangzhu period tombs. From the nature of the jade objects unearthed from a number of these tombs, the archaeologists determined that their occupants had been aristocrats. Archaeologists soon confirmed that this rectangular earthen platform, 300,000 square meters in size, was not natural but man-made. Constructing it would have taken at least 10,000 workers toiling an entire year. Yingan 的 great historian Sima Qian, who lived from around 145 BC to 86 BC, wrote of a hero named Chu Yo who lived in remote antiquity. Chu Yo was said to be an awe-inspiring fighter who had with him 81 brothers. Whether they were blood brothers or sworn brothers from his tribe is still a moot point. We are told his tribe and those allied with him were named Dong Yi, and that they were active in the lower reaches of the Yellow River in present-day Shandong province. Meanwhile, an alliance was formed between Huang Di and Yan Di, and it was named Hua Xia or Cathay. The territory it covered took in present-day Hunan, Shanxi and Shanxi provinces. The two alliances, or the two cultures, progressed rapidly until about 5,000 years ago, when they met and merged to give birth to the Chinese nation, the population of which are descendants of Huang Di and Yan Di. 中国的这个文明呢,它实际上是一个逐步整合的文明。
，它慢慢慢慢融合兼并，越来越大。从政治层面上，它是一种整合；从文化层面上，也是一种整合；从经济层面上，它还是一种整合。这样，中华文明就是在这样的基础上产生的，是越滚越大，势力越来越强。那么，文明的发展越来越稳定，那个越来越加速，一个稳健发展，一直到后来没有中断。炎帝、王帝 and 赤友 and others as yet unknown to us are the ancestors of the Chinese nation. The era between 4,000 and 5,000 years ago produced many heroes, and sagas about them have come down through history to the present age to form the first chapter of Chinese history. That first chapter tells of the first line of civilization to appear on the horizon to shine over the vast Chinese land and proclaim the birth of a nation, China. From 5,000 to 4,000 years ago is an age of legend in China. It gave rise to tales of heroes whose exploits on the battlefield and in creating civilizations wrote the first chapter in Chinese history. In many ways, the development of Chinese civilization was in the earliest days a process of integration in which it was fed by various cultural elements originating in numerous cities and small states. By the time of the Bronze Age, a great nation was on the verge of emerging. We'll hear more about China's Bronze Age in our next episode, and please stay tuned. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Bye for now.